I would like to uh, welcome everyone to the regular meeting of the Garden City Planning Commission. This is Thursday, August 13th, 2020 at 6.35. And to start our meeting, uh, if everyone would stand, uh, we would like to say the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Okay. We can see if you're still sitting. <laughs> okay, I pledge allegiance to the United States of America. America. States of America. Which it stands. Which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty and justice, and justice for all. Thank you. So, Fred, I'm not seeing where Diane is over here because we need to get her in for the quorum. So I'm going to just call her and see if she's got the screen that still says it's loading. But I'm looking at our list of attendees and unless she is on one of the phone numbers here, I'm not seeing her. So I'm just going to try to get a hold and get in contact and get her into the room here. Okay, we'll wait a minute. Would you take the roll call, Secretary? Chairperson May? Here. Commissioner Steenberg? Aye. Commissioner Turnbull? Uh, Aye. Commissioner Hunt? Aye. Commissioner Walls? Commissioner Kalidas? Here. Commissioner Mativier? Here. Okay, we need approval of the agenda for tonight's meeting. Someone cares to make a motion? Make a motion to approve the agenda as written. Support. Motions made and supported. Any questions or comments? Take roll, please. Commissioner Steenberg? Aye. Commissioner Kalitas? Aye. Commissioner Mativier? Aye. Chairperson May. Aye. Uh, the next item is public comment on non agenda items only. This is for items not on the agenda. So, we got to um, do the approval of the minutes. Yes. So we'll oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the approval of the minutes from that. Uh, yeah. Uh, any uh, questions or comments on the, the minutes from the previous meeting of uh, July 9th, 2020? If not, uh, we need a motion to approve. I'll make a motion to accept the minutes from the meeting from July 9th. Support. Motion made and seconded. Uh, any comments or discussion? Seeing none, would you take the roll, please? Commissioner Kalidas? Aye. Commissioner Mativier? Aye. Commissioner Steenberg? Aye. Chairperson May? Aye. Now we can move on to public comments for non agenda items. If anyone in the audience wishes to comment on an item not on the agenda, uh, Raise your hand, let us know. Uh, Brian, do you see anything? I don't see any hands. Nope, no hands. Okay, well, we'll move on then. Uh, next item is business items. Number one, PC 20 005. It's a request for a Special land use recommendation and site plan approval to establish a group daycare home at 30158 Hennepin Street in the R1 single family residential zoning district. Uh, we're having a public hearing on this. If anyone cares, uh, before we go to the comment section, uh, if we can get a presentation by our uh, consultant, Mr. Ortega. Okay, 
Thank you, Fred. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mario Ortega. I'm the city planner for Garden City. As mentioned, we're here tonight to discuss the establishment of, uh, for a group, a group child daycare home at 30158 Hennepin. Um, the existing site is 73 feet wide by 295 feet deep. So that's approximately half an acre in size. It's located on the north side of Hennepin, just east of uh, Henry Ruff. And the applicant is proposing to obtain a license uh, to provide child care and supervision for more than six, but not more than 12 minor children for periods of less than 24 hours a day. So this use is regulated by the state and it also meets the city's definition for a uh, group daycare home. Um, group daycare homes in Garden City require special use approval. And so tonight we'll be going over our special use criteria for this uh, proposed application. Um, there are an extensive number of criteria that we go over, but the majority of the issues um, for any special use is compatibility. Compatibility of the proposed use with the uh, existing uh, uses, the, the zoning districts in the area, and um, uh, as a primary concern to make sure that uh, the operation of such a use is compatible. So, um, as mentioned, uh, so this site on Hennepin is within a single family residential zone neighborhood. Uh, it's majority single family around the site. Uh, from between South of Ford Road and between Middleton and Merriman, this is our, one of our primary uh, residential neighborhoods. Uh, so the applicant is not proposing to alter the structure in any way, but the primary change will be in the character, will be the level of activity generated on the site because the, uh, the use, a uh, group child daycare home, will, could have a greater impact on uh, adjacent property um, depending on how it's operated. Usually the first indicator of that is the hours of operation. If this were to be an extended amount of time, uh, however, the applicant has indicated that the hours of operation here will be from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. So this in, is within normal daylight hours and it doesn't extend into the evening. So therefore it's not creating a high level of activity beyond uh, the daytime hours. So probability of the hours of operation uh, negatively impacting adjacent residences is uh, potentially minimal. Um, an initial criteria uh, we must look at is um, the number of vehicles that would be visiting the site. Uh, Childcare facilities generally, generally gen generate about two trips per day for each child um, for the drop off and pickup of the children. Therefore, uh, the applicant uh, by requiring a, a requesting to be licensed for up to 12 children um, there's that potential increase in vehicle trips to the site. Um, now the, the, the existing facility, or excuse me, the existing residence is already home to three children. Um, so depending on the particulars of the uh, license, if those children are included in the 12 that are be allowed to be on site, um, this can generate at least 18 additional vehicle trips per day. And actually in single family homes, single family homes actually typically generate nine and a half vehicle trips per day. So to go from nine and a half to at least 18, if not 24 vehicle trips, additional vehicle trips per day, um, it is a sizable increase. Uh, however, the applicant has indicated they're going to be staggering uh, the trips to the site in order to minimize, to attempt to minimize the probability of multiple vehicles uh, visiting the site at once. Um, so in the end, we believe this is going to be a very important factor because how the use is going to operate will be a primary factor in determining if this can be compatible with the adjacent single family homes. Um, in terms of compatibility, one other thing we look at is the compatibility with the master plan. Uh, so future land use for this site is for uh, garden residential uh, future land use category. So the garden residential are for those lots that are closer to the core of uh, the city's downtown, uh, which is generally bound, generally bound by Henry Ruff over, up to Maplewood, over to Harrison on the east and down to Marquette. And it's envisioned that these lots uh, could either promote community gardens and open space 
uh, or preserve the existing, just guard and block, preserve the existing character, character or permit flexible housing development. Um, that's mainly because these lots are deeper uh, than most lots in the city. So therefore they have the probability of being utilized in uh, these additional ways in addition to preservation. Um, but the, the master plan promotes the maintaining the integrity of single family neighborhoods primarily by keeping out uh, intense uses. And that's usually done by keeping out intense and commercial uses um, because those commercial uses generate high level of activity uh, on a site. Uh, typically not only with the hours of operation, but once again with the vehicle trips generated per, uh, per day. So um, the, the issue here too is that a group daycare home is intended to provide a, a service within a residential area in a different environment than a commercial child care center. That's the uh, commercial child care center is a state definition for those commercial facilities that have primarily it's only utilized for child daycare because the community feels the quantity of children necessitates these um, that activity, that child caring activity be located in commercial areas just because the uh, character of having that many trips and that many children on a site just would not be compatible with the residential area. Uh, so once again, that when it comes to compatibility with the master plan, while uh, this area could possibly uh, be the, well, it would be the one area in the city that could ma uh, uh, accommodate these type of large, large group home child care facilities. It has to be balanced with our other primary goal of the city, which is ba uh, preserving the residential integrity of the existing. Um, so then, well, additionally, one thing I'd like to point out is that our zoning ordinance require, has two specific requirements for um, child group homes. Um, the first being uh, licensing. Uh, particularly with the state of Michigan, uh, all child care facilities are required to be licensed through uh, the License and Regulatory Affairs Bureau, or nickname, our acronym is LARA. Um, and because this a bureau within LARA, uh, it receives and issues licenses for family and group daycare homes. So this process involves, the very first step in the process is them applying to the city to see if the local zoning approves of use, and then the applicant um, goes through the paperwork of background checks and other uh, approvals uh, from a paperwork standpoint. And then the final step in the process is a state inspector visits its site to determine compliance with the rules governing uh, child care, uh, such as whatever they have for things as a locked play area, pool access, and other safety issues. Um, however, that's governed by the state. So how it operates from a child caring standpoint is regulated by the state. And so, but any approval that the planning commission uh, may grant should be contingent upon the applicant submitting a copy of any approved state license if they receive their state license. Um, so in addition to the license, the other criteria within the zoning ordinance is that the applicant provide outdoor play area. Uh, basically, uh, it has to be at least a minimum of 5,000 square feet. The applicant is, it does have a large yard. Um, however, we note that on the site plan, there isn't a, a specifically defined 5,000 square foot area. There are a lot of different accessory structures in that, that rear yard. So we would just uh, suggest that uh, another condition of approval be the applicant if the planning commission were to grant a recommend approval that the applicant provide a, a revised site plan indicating the boundaries of the outdoor play area. Um, once again, in terms of compatibility, just going over the final criteria for special use, um, and use of adjacent property, uh, you take in consideration, as mentioned, it's all residential surrounding the property. It's all zoned single family residential. Um, so while it will be uh, primarily utilized for uh, children playing, and that's something that's generally compatible with residential areas, it also is, uh, has to take in consideration the size and scale of it. The fact that 12 children will be playing 
uh, in one location. Uh, while the lot is large, it is deep, it's, it's still only 73 feet in width. So that might impact how close the, the children in the play area will be to the adjacent neighbors and whether that will impact the, um, the enjoyment of the adjacent properties with the, uh, this proposed use. You look at other things such as public uh, services and uh, impact on public health, safety, and welfare. It won't impact those type of individual uh, uses. Um, however, another primary factor, as mentioned, is the parking, or excuse me, the traffic, impact on traffic. Um, I've already discussed the trips generated on the site. Uh, Hennepin, it's not a major thoroughfare, uh, such as Ford Road, however, uh, but which could it, Excuse me. Ford Road could easily accommodate uh, this traffic. Any of our principal arterials could handle the amount of traffic involved. Um, however, then the conundrum is these facilities are located on high volume traffic roads that um, might have developed a safety concern with children being direct access onto those roads. Um, so that's one way to balance it. However, once again, the state regulates the safety issue in terms of the children. Um, and how it's operating uh, for any kind of security. Um, the site is about between a third and a half of a mile from major thoroughfares. Uh, so in theory, it could handle uh, direct access to those. Plus, because of the grid pattern in the city, uh, the, the potential for the traffic to be dispersed. Um, but in the end, once again, the primary issue is going to be compatibility of this use with the area. Uh, and it's the amount of traffic that could be generated on the site with up to 12 children and doing drop offs and um, pickups. So that's an additional potentially up to 24 trips. Um, one way to minimize the impact on traffic and vehicle parking uh, would be if, in addition to the to develop some type of staggered schedule for the pickups and drop offs, such as a specific number of vehicles allowed in a 15 minute period um, while potentially handling this. We know that the site itself um, only has a one, one lane uh, drive driveway. Uh, normally we would like to see these type of uh, traffic and drop off and pickups be handled completely off the public right of way. Um, so scheduling and maintaining pickups and drop-offs in the driveway would also be important. Um, so while the potential exists to regulate it in such a way with uh, the conditions of special use approval by the Planning Commission, the main issue is going to be uh, enforcement and actual compliance with such uh, an order. Um, it would fall to ordinance enforcement and um, uh, basically the ordinance enforcement officers to monitor, potentially monitor, but they don't have that capability from a staffing standpoint, but they would have to respond to any complaints because unfortunately we're uh, complaint driven when it comes to ordinance violations. Um, so while in the end, the, the primary tool to handle the traffic is some type of specific regulations as part of special use approval. Um, there will be issues with uh, compliance. So in the end, uh, when it comes to the special use, uh, if the planning commission were to feel that the uh, use could be operated in a compatible way, then any approval would be contingent upon uh, the applicant submitting an approved state license submitting an approved uh, a revised landscape, excuse me, revised site plan that identifies the five, specifically identifies the 5,000 square foot outdoor play area. And then submittal of a signed operation plan, plan by the applicant outlining any drop off and pick up schedule, parking requirements and any other conditions uh, as approved by the planning commission. Now real briefly, in addition to special use, we do grant special uh, site plan approval for this uh, use. And so mainly that all the comments I've just mentioned with regards to traffic and to um, um, parking are, are uh, 
related to the site plan issue as well. So the operation plan for traffic and drop off and pick up and parking would be paramount to any kind of site plan approval as well. So those are the issues um, with regards to both special land use and site plan. And I'm available to answer anybody's questions at the appropriate time. To the chair. Yes, Mr. Steinberg. Yeah. Um, when I visited the site, I noticed that uh, their garage is set considerably back from the street. And uh, they have a fence that's fairly close to the street. They could accommodate two vehicles in the driveway if they weren't parking their personal vehicles in that location. If they parked them to the rear of the fence, which they have ample room to do that in front of their garage during business hours, I would like to see that made as a stipulation if we should approve this and move it forward. Also, um, so they could accommodate two in the driveway and the width of the front of the house could accommodate uh, two on the street, which we really don't want to use. Um, does fire suppression come into play here? In the past, I believe it was 5,000 square feet when the state required fire suppression to be uh, mandatory. Uh, what is it in a in this type of situation with a personal residence? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, the issues you'd be facing, the applicant would be facing is, number one, any uh, requirements from the licensing rules. Like if they might have a higher level of standard than uh, normal standard. But in addition to the licensing rules, we also have our, if the applicant were to receive approval, because it's a change of use, we would have the fire, uh, fire marshal go into the site and he would dictate any kind of requirements based on the fire code. Now what those are, whether because of the change in use changes those, I don't know if it's different so than at, single family, but it's based on the fire code. So at that point, in the event of a storm, a power outage, whatever the case may be, uh, he might require illuminated uh, exit points and smoke alarms that were both visual and auditory for children that might be challenged in that area to alert them. Uh, is that something that he would do, Fred? Yeah, that's very possible. I mean, I don't know what the current uh, fire code would be for a group daycare, but uh, we could make as part of a uh, site plan review condition that the fire marshal inspect it and make sure it's brought up the code. Um, I part of this I see a liability issue on the city's part. Um, if we include safety items, um, so I'm thinking that that would be a better thing to come from Laura and the licensing aspect of it and whatever insurance they're required to, to have in order to do this. Well, I'm sure Laura has well-developed uh, plans for a, a group daycare, but our approval of a site plan kind of gives us, uh, puts us in the position of having a, approved whatever they happen to have. If, if there's a condition that may not be that safe and we don't say anything about it and the state doesn't say anything about it, then where does the responsibility fall? I, I, think, uh, I think having the fire inspection would pretty much take care of that aspect of it. But I see another safety issue in having a swimming pool in the backyard too, which appears to be an unprotected above ground pool. I haven't seen it, but I'm not sure if that come, would come under the city's responsibility to provide for, or if that falls on the state. 
I, I tried to look for that when I was reviewing the site and being on the public sidewalk and not walking on private property, I couldn't determine whether it had an enclosure around it or not. But, and um, according to my notes, I'm guessing it's bigger than 17 inch. Uh, if I may, we do have <laughs> we do have some pictures uh, submitted to us uh, from the public, and it is an above ground pool higher than 17 inch. Without based on the the one angle we have, it's not secured for, with a fence. Um, now, whether that, that's a requirement of the state, I I don't know because I looked myself for the the most recent updated rules from Lara for child group uh, child care. Sorry child daycare, and unfortunately I couldn't find applicable rules. They, they're rules that the uh, Bureau can update as they see fit. Um, so unfortunately I don't have that answer. I've read in the past that uh, swimming pools in residential areas are the number one cause of uh, child drowning. So that's something that I think that's a significant danger when you're talking about having 12 kids running around in the backyard in an otherwise unsecured area. Absolutely. And they have one or two uh, caregivers out there. It's pretty hard to keep track of 12 kids. At every minute and it doesn't take long for one of them to get away and crawl up in a pool. I think if if we should seek to uh, approve this part of the site plan should be fencing off that pool area. That could now, be part of uh, securing the, uh, the 5,000 square foot play area too. Go ahead. Do I remember reading that uh, this would be for children in the age group of two and a half to five only? I mean, all I saw was um, minor. Is, is there a on that, Mario? Um, based, I saw you were breaking up there a little, Fred, um, but based on the submittal uh narrative from the applicant and, and you're right mike that's uh two and a half to, to five well we and we can ask the um the applicant uh at the appropriate time or uh for any additional information regarding either that uh, to the if the state gives them a license for a daycare for minors are they going to be limited to that age group uh, I'm not sure how detailed those age groups can get. Uh, I do believe uh, their license would specifically state uh, the type of children that would be allowed because uh, to the best of my knowledge, the licensing rules um, and the number of caregivers is based on the age of the children. So I can take a look at some of the other licenses that are issued in the city to see if they're specifically indicating the, the age groups. Yeah. I think that I think it really matters because when I was working, there were occasions when we pulled four-year-olds out of a pool. So that age group is just as much a danger as the older kids, I believe. And it would be just as necessary to secure that pool. Well, before we go into any more discussion, if you're done, Mario, maybe we should uh, move on to the uh, presentation by the applicant, and then we can open the public hearing. But uh, Brian, do you want to bring the applicant in for comments? Um, yep. So I got a Jason. If you can bring the applicant, um, Dusty Duncan. She's got her hand raised. She is able to speak now. Right. Ms. Duncan, can you hear us? Can you hear me now? Yes. 
Okay, wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for having me on tonight. I appreciate it. Um, I uh, this is your chance to uh, make a presentation to us about your application, if you'd like okay. to go ahead with that. Yes, yes. So I listened to your guys' um, question it's about the um, property and the things that are that are in my backyard and stuff like that. And I want to assure you that I have sold my swimming pool and sold my hot tub and they are being removed before my daycare opens. There's also a trampoline back there that is also going. So I will have no hazards to the children in, in my care. Um, also, the age group, um, when it's coming to Lara licensing is for infant to, um, I believe it's five, I'll have to double check, but then I know that they can, you can allow school age children for after care and before care. However, my main um, objective or my, my main um, age range that I would like to care for is two and a half to five because I come from an early childhood education background. I'm actually leaving a center where I am a teacher of four-year-olds that I've been teaching at for over 10 years. Um, and I do have one infant um, because she happens to be the sister of a four-year-old. <laughs> um, so I will have one infant, but the rest of them, um, the children will be between the ages of two and a half to five. I don't foresee in any of my future that I will extend that um, age because this is the age that I'm comfortable with. This is, I am, will be teaching kindergarten readiness um, for um, the children that are in my care. And um, it's too hard to do that when you have toddlers running around <laughs> or infants to take care of. Um, so that's my, that's my main age range. Um, as far as um, fire code, from what I've read in the licensing rules, we have to have um, smoke detectors in every room, which we do have. We also have carbon monoxide detectors, and we have to have fire extinguishers, which will be on the premises. But I will go above and beyond and also call in the fire marshal on my own accord, whether licensing requires it or not, um, to make sure that my home is safe for the children that I care for. I would be devastated if something happened on my watch. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else. Is there, oh, my parking, we will absolutely, me and my husband have already discussed that we will um, park. We have two vehicles. We have a little small Kia Soul, which we will park in our um, garage and our car will be pulled down. Um, just like um, Mr. Steenberg said, um, all the way down our driveway, so that way it could accommodate more vehicles in our driveway. Uh, our goal is to, and also with the COVID, because we have our licensing rules, and then we also now with COVID, we have the COVID side of it too. So it's 14 pages of additional safety precautions that we have to take, and we will um, be following those strictly. And one of them is that you absolutely have to have stagger drop-offs. Not only will that help with the traffic situation on the streets and in the neighborhood, but it will also um, help with the exposure of COVID. So we want to keep everybody as safe as possible. Parents will not be able to come into the home um, for pickup and drop-off. So there won't be extended times to stay and talk and be here for a long time hogging up the streets or the, or the driveway or anything like that. They will be um, required to send me a text when they're um, on their way and when they're about to pick up or drop off so I can be ready or have my husband um, ready to walk out to pick up the child. Um, so that way pick up time and drop off time is very short. Um, I'm trying to think we have, we will have temperature checks and all of that in place. So um, for COVID exposure, the um, standard um, questionnaires asking the same thing that hospitals ask, we would ask as well. And um, items are not allowed to be brought in and from homes to um, protect the spread of COVID also. Um, but I've been in, in early childhood education for over 17 years. 
Um, and I worked at Lathers Elementary, started off there in the preschool program over there. And then for the over 10 years, I've been at Family First Learning Center in Canton. I've been a substitute teacher to an assistant, to a teacher, to a director. <laughs> um, so I've done all the roles. And um, now with COVID, I'd like to provide a service, especially with the schools going completely virtual. Preschools are kind of stuck um, because let's be real, a preschooler is not gonna sit in front of a Zoom call to be taught. So um, having uh, this preschool in my home, it will eliminate the um, large group exposure that you would find in a center where the center I came from ran anywhere from 40 to 100 children. Um, there will be no more than 12 enrolled preschoolers here um, at a time. So if you all choose to approve my request. <laughs> so do you have any questions for me that I could further clarify for, for you or? Does anyone, Mr. Timber? Yes. Um, Dusty, is it? Yes. Um, Dusty, this is Mike Steinberg. Uh, how old are your kids? I have a seven-year-old. I have a six, well, he's about, he'll be he's 15. 15 years old and 17 years old. Okay. Will, will your children be part of the count for the 12? No, they will not. Okay. Um, according to licensing, they don't, they aren't included in that number because they live here. Will they be there? Um, will your children be doing school virtually at home or will they be off site for school? They will be here virtually all year for school. Whether the schools go back or not, um, if I have the choice, they'll be here online. So you won't have us going to and from schools. Okay. Uh, how many full time workers, full time meaning during your hours of operation of uh, seven to five. How many full-time workers do you uh, uh, project? It will be myself and my husband. And then I have a um, substitute. She's actually a teacher at Garden City Middle School. She will sub for me if I absolutely need her to, but she won't be here on the daily because she'll be teaching at the middle school. <laughs> gotcha. And, um, so you say the pool, the hot tub, and the trampoline will all be gone prior to opening of the uh, center? Yes, sir. And what is the height of your fence, and is it a complete backyard fenced? Um, on the right side of my house, I have a standard. I don't know that I didn't measure it, so I'm not sure how to answer that, except for on the right side, for a portion, a portion of my fence, it's a privacy fence. Um, okay. Regular wood. And then on the left side, it's a standard chain link fence. Okay. And it's fenced all the way around, a chain link all the way around, even behind the privacy fence. Okay, thank you. That's all for me. Yeah. Does anyone else have a question for Mrs. Duncan? Okay, unless you have something else, we'll move on to uh, the um, Brad McCurring. Yes, Brian. So it looks like Rand, Randy lost connection. So he, he dropped out of our thing. So if we want to, wanna, before we open up the public hearing, let me see if we can get him back in. So, because then. We'll do, we'll our, take a um, brief recess until we get uh, Randy back. Call the meeting back to order. Uh, and you had a question for, for Dusty? I do. We do have a picture of your backyard. It looks like that you have like a back porch. Is that like a door wall going onto the back porch from the house to the porch? And is that secured? Or is it like going from the backyard up some steps? To, a, to another door or a door wall? So my, my house, um, my basement has an addition to it and it has two exits out the, out the basement. So on the, so if you're standing on my deck to the left, that is a door wall. 
with some stairs there um, and railings. There are railings. Right. And then to the right of my um, deck, there is a single entrance door um, that is locked. It also goes down and has stairs to it also. And I also have all egress windows. Okay. It matters. But <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. Yeah, and if there's a way that, you know, if, if licensing comes out, obviously, and says, you know, that it's a safety precaution, I will do whatever I need to do, obviously, to make it safe. Okay, great. Thank you for answering. You're welcome. Okay, is there any other questions before we uh, go to the public hearing? If not... Uh, we'll open uh, to public comments. Uh, do we have anyone waiting for comments, uh, Brian? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, we got a few hands. Um, looks like Melanie Nunez. Uh, we can start. Uh, she's got her hand up. Okay. Jason can bring her in. <clears throat> There we are, Melanie, can you hear us? Oh, you're, Ms. Nunez, you're on mute right now. Can you, can you, right. press, can you hear me now? There you go. Yep. All right, well, I just wanted to thank yep. you for allowing me to um, comment tonight. Um, I also wanted to just let you guys know um, a little bit about myself. I am a fourth generation out of six generations family that has lived in Garden City um, all the way back from my great grandparents and I have two great nieces. So we are um, just longtime residents of the city and I'm also a teacher in Garden City um, and a friend of Dusty's. And I just wanted to say how excited I am that she is, going to be opening a preschool slash daycare in our community. Um, she is a gifted preschool teacher um, who not only gets her students ready for kindergarten, but she actually even takes them beyond that. Um, she, the majority of her students leave her program reading and not just their letter sounds, but they learn their blends, they learn their sight words, and with the third grade reading law um, in place, having somebody who is getting our young students prepared and ready um, before they've even entered our public school system is such a benefit for Garden City. And it really, I mean, if she has six, um, then that's six kids that are going in strong to our school district. But if she has 12, that's even more. And so um, I just feel like her, um, addition of this preschool into our um, city and our community is such an invaluable influence for those kids. Um, so I just wanted to um, say that I'm really looking forward to that as a public school teacher, just watching those kids come in with a base for learning and an excitement for learning is really going to benefit our city. Okay, thank you. Is yep. that all you have to say? Then? Yeah, that's all. Okay, thank you. Brian, would you bring in the next? Uh, all right. Oh, uh, thank like, you again. Uh, Sherry Frost. Brian, would you bring in the next? Uh, yep. Good evening. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I don't right. have a picture. Well, I can assure you that um, if you did, it would be a wonderful picture. <laughs> um, <laughs> my name is Sherry Frost and I am a resident of Garden City and I just wanted to speak in support of uh, Dusty Duncan's petition. Um, I have known Dusty for about eight years, uh, but over this past year specifically, I've spent a great amount of time with Dusty and have really come to know her as a friend. Um, she is 
kind and reliable and dependable. Uh, but most of all, she is an encourager and a devoted mother and an advocate for children. Um, quality child care can be really difficult to find, but especially in a pandemic. And I think that Garden City is so fortunate to have someone in Dusty who is a well-qualified early childhood educator who is willing to open up her home, not just to babysit, but to teach our kids and encourage our kids and continue to help them to feel included. Um, and so I just think in a time when um, we have businesses that are closing left and right that um, I hope that we can uh, welcome her efforts with open arms and uh, help her to succeed. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Sherry. Brian? All right, uh, Brittany Felton. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Actually, this is Austin Feldman, before you think I'm a really deep voice, Brittany. <laughs> um, I just wanted to uh, speak on behalf for uh, Dusty, who I have been a friend of the Duncans for many years now. And um, I actually work in law enforcement. I work for the Department of Homeland Security as a uh, Border Patrol agent. And we are considered uh, essential personnel. And the like COVID, uh, government shutdowns, doesn't matter. We got to keep working, you know, 24 seven. And I can speak firsthand on the importance of having options for like daycare and education. Um, I'm a chaplain for the agency as well. And a lot of times we run into agents who are stressed out. They're worried about where are they going to send their kids? Are their kids going to be safe? Um, and it is just so vital and important that there be uh, places for their uh, children to go to. And I know that Dusty is beyond a blessing to the community, uh, beyond a blessing to my family and to other families. Um, and I couldn't recommend her highly enough. And I just wanted to make sure I said my piece. Okay, thank you. Brian, do you have a note? Um, yep, so Monica Gamut. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I would right, say so that, can you hear? Okay. I hear, can, those kids are not coming from my background. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I would like to say I was a longtime Garden City resident. Unfortunately, no longer. I moved out in 2017, but I lived there since 1976. I worked at Leathers uh, Kindergarten Campus, and I will tell you that I saw the need for childcare greatly. So many parents coming in and needing care for their children that were not old enough to go to school yet. They wanted help with um, their children that weren't ready for school yet. And this is so needed in Garden City and how wonderful to be so close to Memorial Elementary there, this home. And um, I, I would uh, love to see more than just this, uh, this home that Dusty is opening up in childcare. I'd love to see them throughout the city because 12 children is just not enough. But if we can start with 12, that's a great start. I think as the city, I love to see cities that welcome people that are trying to bring business into their city and make it a better community. And that's what Dusty is trying to do. When she brings these children in, she also brings their parents in. They will come into the city to eat, to shop. They may even look, you know, when I was a young parent and looking for a home, I looked at a city at their school district. I wanted to see where my children are going to school. If we have a daycare that is like this, I would move into a city for that daycare for, for my younger children. You may see people wanting to flock to Garden City if you started something like this throughout the community. I think that um, I've known Dusty for over 20 years. She is a great candidate for this. She's a great teacher. 
She works well with children and she is honest, great citizen. Will, uh, you will be very um, proud of this business once you um, allow this to happen. I believe that uh, it will be something you'll be telling people about and saying, send your child there. This is wonderful. You're going to hear, if you ask any of the parents that have had their children under her care, you will hear nothing but rave reviews. And um, you will, you will be, you'll be happy that you approve this. So I encourage you to say, go for it, because she's willing to do all these things to bring her house up to code, to make the children safe, so that she can, can do this for, for the community of Garden City. Well, thank you, Monica. You're welcome. Brian, do you have anyone else? Yep, um, let's go to um, Cecilia Nesbitt. Looks like she's been waiting for a little bit. Cecilia, can you hear us? Can you hear us, Ms. Nesbitt? Well, let's let's come back to her. Okay. Oh, it's muted now. Unmuted. Can you hear us? Nothing. Nothing. Okay, we'll come back to Cecilia. Uh, how about Amanda? Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, um, my name is Amanda and I'm a physical therapist at the Rehab Institute of Michigan downtown. Um, I grew up in Garden City. I graduated from Garden City High School. I currently live in Westland. And basically when I came off of maternity leave in June, I really struggled with where I was going to send my children that was going to be safe. Um, I myself went to in-home daycare. My four-year-old started at in-home daycare and we did have to move her. Um, it did come at a good time because with COVID, my husband was off and I was on maternity leave. So in the meantime, we were looking for somewhere to send her as well as my newborn. And Dusty, being a friend of ours for the last eight years, said, you know what? Let's go ahead and take on the girls for the summer. I don't mind at all. Um, and that really put me at ease. And when she took on my four month old and my four year old back in July, so just over a month ago, um, ever since then, those kids have come home happy. I, I know they're loved, they're well fed. She keeps me in constant. I assume. Looks like Amanda's on mute. Um, Amanda's muted, so. Okay, sorry. Oh, oh you back? Yeah, how long was I muted? <laughs> 10 seconds or so. Okay, okay, so basically, um, Dusty came to me and said that she was looking to start the daycare and would I want my kids to, to stay with her? And there was no hesitation, no doubt in my mind that this is where my kids belong. Um, Dusty and Jordan, her husband, are just really fantastic people. Um, they are respectful. I know that they're teaching my children respect. I know that they are looking after them. They're providing, um, they're providing education for them. They're giving them a great Christian foundation. So I, you know, this is going to be something that's really great. And for me, it's helpful because I, my kids would not qualify for like any of the pre, free preschool programs. And I know, especially in Garden City, um, the preschool program that would be available for me would have like, have to have after school childcare because I work until at least five o'clock and I'm in Detroit. Um, and so between my husband and I working full time, you know, her hours go until five o'clock. My husband can get her or both of my girls actually, um, and versus just a normal school program where I would be rushing to get to the school to get them in time. So, you know, there's so many benefits for my kids and, and, you know, just getting, getting my four-year-old, especially ready for kindergarten 
and not having to send her at this time to a big daycare center where there's a lot more people with, with COVID going around, you know, that's really comforting to me. And I know that Dusty's got a ton of experience. So it wasn't even a question to me whether my four-year-old who I'm not just bragging about her, but she's pretty darn smart, you know, she's still going to thrive in Dusty's hands because I know Dusty's going to challenge her. Um, so I, I do recommend that, you know, you guys look into allowing Dusty to take on the, the 12 kids that she's wanting to take on because they would just be a great asset. And my kids already are kind of the guinea pigs and they're, they're turning out just fine. Okay, is that it? Yep, that's it, thank you. Okay, thank you, Amanda. Brian? All right, yep, let's try uh, Cecilia again. Cecilia, can you hear us? Ms. Nesbitt, can you hear us? Uh, apparently she's not with us. All right, uh, let's try Lori. Okay. All right, can you hear us? Lori, are you there? I don't see a microphone in the corner of her screen. Uh, so it looks like it's not on mute. Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on with that one. All right, let's see. Cool. We'll try Miss ne Miss Nesbit one more time. Okay. Perhaps uh, if they're having any issues, they could possibly use the chat feature. There's a chat bubble at the lower menu. Uh, menu. Maybe if they type something in the chat, just to say if they're trying to speak or if they don't want to speak anymore. Ms. Nesbitt, can you hear? No. I have a number one where, where, well, now I have two on my chat. Shall we uh, click on that and see what we get, uh, Brian? So, I've, I've, I've sent, uh, I sent Ms. Nesbitt a message. Okay. If, um, if she's able to hear us. Um, if you are able to hear us in the bottom right corner there under the chat, you can uh, reply. You'd like to make a statement that way. I'm not seeing any response down there. Oh. I just clicked on chat and let's see. It says uh, from Lori, all participants on my laptop, it says Mark is inviting me to a meeting. From Brian to Cecilia to all panelists, good evening. Are you able to hear us? No, we are not. Well, I, <laughs> it's a chat, so I guess I got to type something in there. Uh, to whom it may concern, this day and age being a parent is scary business, having to work and leave your children with a person who is not you is exceptionally hard. You're always second guessing if you made the right choice to work, to leave your baby in the care of another human. With that said, I have three children and I'd be 100% comfortable and happy if they were in the care of my dear friend, Dusty Duncan. Dusty is the first lady of a church in Garden City. They are contributing members of the city and are offering to open a home daycare to provide a loving and safe place for parents such as myself to bring their children. Um, there should be no concern about a new home daycare opening in the home of Mr. and Mrs. Duncan. I would highly encourage the city to pass the approval needed to, to, uh, to allow the home daycare center to open. Please feel free to contact me if you have any questions. 
Okay, well, thank you. Uh, Brian, do you have any others? Yeah, so it looks like, uh, I think it's I think it's Lori, I might be pronouncing it wrong, but L-O-R-E um, has uh, a hand raised. So let's see if, if they can connect to us. Uh, can you hear us? That's, that's what I just read, Brian. That was from Lori on the chat. No, that one came from, uh, because that's that's one that one came from Amy Ray is the one who sent that message. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. We can. We can hear you. Yeah. Am I up? Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So we, there are a few concerns, um, and we can start with you know Hennepin has a lot of houses that are grandfathered in by laws of the sidewalk. Excuse me. Can you first tell us who you are and where you live? Oh, I'm your, sorry. I thought you were going to let me sign in. Your general location. So. My name is Lori, and I live a couple doors no, down from the proposed daycare. Okay, that's good. Okay. Good. So, first, let me ask: Will the petition be read? Yes, we we did receive the the petition. Um, that's going to come up later under the uh, presentation of written communications. Okay. In addition, Hennepin is not a designated bus route. However, the bus drivers prefer Hennepin. So there is that traffic as well. Also, there are very few sidewalks on Hennepin. For instance, uh, the sidewalk on my side of the street covers three houses and ends, or four houses, and then it ends. and we have to walk in the street, ride in the street. Hennepin is a very, very busy street. Cars fly down Hennepin. So then there's that too. Um, in addition to, I hear a lot of people say, there's, there aren't any schools open. However, I'll be sending my granddaughter, she's three, I'll be sending her to preschool this year. So uh, I, I don't, I guess, I'm not aware of all the preschools closing down. Uh, I know they're limited. Her school is gonna have like, I don't know, 30 to 50 children. They also have like 10 teachers. Um, so I don't think there's a problem with preschools. Maybe people haven't looked for them. Uh, there are some other issues as well. And I think a lot of them are covered in the petition, but I would have a question for Dusty and that would be, um, when was the last time she worked in in teaching? Ma'am, this is not a time for you to uh, question and answer time. This is just a time for you to make a statement about the proposal. Oh, okay. Um, well, in addition to that, then I would make this statement. When COVID happened, I had one daughter in high school and one in college, and I had my granddaughter here who was almost three. And both my kids take their studies very seriously. One's at Divine Child, and, and the other one was going to school craft to transfer to Michigan State. Um, and they had to do a couple classes by Zoom, which presented a problem with my three-year-old, the three-year-old here, because she was loud. Luckily, I have a large home, so I was able to go to the family room and try to keep her away. And then the weather warmed up and we, I could take her outside on days when they had their Zoom classes. But since her children will all be doing online schooling, I'm wondering how the, you know, the noise level and if their own studies won't be jeopardized by having an additional 12 children in the home. Well, again, we can't respond to your, your question, but uh, did you have anything else to say? Uh, 
Are well, you? I guess I would say that I'm very happy that they finally cleaned their yard. It's the first time since they moved in almost a little more than two and a half years ago. So I'm appreciative of that. Would you like to say too, since you live next door? I think we're all all appreciative of that. As you can see, every neighbor in the neighborhood signed. That's it. Okay. If, thank you. If there was nothing else, then Brian. Um. Let's see any other hands? I'm not seeing any other new hands up. Uh, there was one other message in the chat, which I can read, um, but we would prefer, you know, if anyone wanted to make a statement to do it, uh, just raise your hand and we'll bring you in, um, unless if you are able to, unless you're having communication issues. Um, but I can just read this real quick. Um, it says from Matt and Angie, um, it says, I have a degree in early childhood education and work in Head Start. I fully support Ms. Duncan. I am familiar with her ideology and it will serve to provide a quality education for the children in her care. Okay, good. All right, uh, we, let's try, um, Cecilia Nesbitt's got her hand up. Uh, let's try one more time if she can hear us. Uh, it does say talking is permitted on her end. Uh, can you hear us, Ms. Nesbitt? Miss Nesmit, can you uh, hear? It looks like sure her. It looks like she's muted. Okay, she's off mute now. Well, and can you hear us now? No, we don't seem to be able to connect with um, Miss Nesmit. So, uh, Brian, why don't we? Uh, Move on then. If you don't have any other uh, people waiting to uh, to speak, then uh, I'll close the uh, public hearing and uh, ask you to uh, present any written communications that you have. Okay. Uh, yes, so we do have several several written communications um, that the office, the planning office received. Um, the, the petition that was mentioned, I'll, I'll start with that one, um, was received today in the planning office. Um, if you'd like, I can read the petition and give you the information. I sent this along to the commission about five, a little bit after, uh, before the meeting began, um, but I can read it to you. Um, it was petitioning to Mr. Mario Ortega and the Garden City Planning Commission and the Michigan Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs, or LARA. Uh, petition summary is unsafe conditions. Um, according to the petition, it says the property prior to their purchase has been, had been completely renovated and well landscaped. Over the past two and a half years, the property has been neglected there have been several code enforcement violations. Uh, it says, please see attached photos. There were approximately 10 photos included with it, um, showcasing the, the condition of the yard. Um, then it also states pool filled with algae, uh, damaged trampoline, uh, blown to the rear of the lot by a storm four months ago, electrical cords draped over deck, bottles of chlorine in doorway of hot tub enclosure, uh, building materials stored behind garage and overgrown vegetation. Uh, there have been multiple police and ambulance visits to the aforementioned home. Last year, a neighbor's police scanner picked up a 911 call referencing an attempted suicide at the residence. It is implausible to believe this would be a safe environment to add additional children under their care. Uh, then it says, action petitioned. It says, we, the undersigned, are concerned Garden City residents and urge Garden City Planning Commission to require these issues be addressed immediately. Children, non-family members are currently being taken care of at the residence and there is a concern for their safety. 
We also ask Laura to review these items closely and making a determination. Uh, below that is the signature lines for the petition. Uh, it is filled to line 37. There are two blank lines, uh, so 35 signatures are included on there. Um, and then that petition will be uh, submitted, you know, into our files uh, for the meeting date as well. Um, so we do have that. That is the petition that was mentioned. Um, I do also have a letter from a D. Marlowe at 30158 Hennepin um, stating their concerns uh, for you know, the proposed uh, daycare facility. Um, to summarize the letter, it states that they are concerned about the potential increase in traffic on it. Uh, and it states that there are, you know, if they wish to start a daycare business, there are many buildings um, that could be utilized in Garden City. Uh, so, so we're in the middle of a global pandemic. We do not need a lot of extra people in the neighborhood. Uh, nor do we need the extra noise or traffic. Um, so that was uh, from 30158 Hennepin, uh, speaking in opposition. And then the largest section of written communications we received uh, came to planning today. Um, it's a collection of 20 letters and emails uh, in support of the applicant. Uh, one is from a neighbor. Uh, many are from uh, family, friends, and uh, local, you know, members of the church. And there are also a few in here from uh, people familiar with them um, that the applicant has worked with in a uh, child care setting before. Um, if you'd like, I, I can read through a couple of them. Um, if you want me to just kind of summarize as a whole, I can do that. But, um, but there are 20 different I do recognize some of the names in here um, from some of the people who spoke at the public hearing, um, but I'll leave it up to the chair if you would prefer me to just summarize or. Well, unless somebody has a, a problem, I, I think just summarizing the gist of the letters would be adequate. Okay, so basically um, they, it, it's, 20, 20 different letters, a uh, very similar message um, that they all um, believe that the applicant is a, is a dedicated educator, um, that you know, they, they speak highly of her experience uh, working with children and believe that it would be a positive uh, environment for children. Um, that's the general consensus of, of the 20 um, emails and letters that we received today on that is um, of, of these 20, they were 20 in support of, of the uh, proposed venture. Okay, thank you. Was there any other written communications? Um, those were, the, those were the, the, the petition, the 20 from today, and then the other one um, were all our written communications. And uh, each one of those will be put into the file um, and logged as being submitted to the Planning Commission. Okay. Uh, well, with that, then I'll close the public hearing. And then, Fred, we do have a couple hands up that have popped up while I was reading and summarizing that. Uh, you know, if you want me to bring them in. Uh, yeah, if we only have two, we can do that. Okay. Uh, let's go to Eric. Hello. Hello, Eric. Hi, good to meet you guys. Uh, my name is Eric Hinkle. I am formerly a resident of Garden City. I'm stationed out in Dallas right now with the Marine Corps. Um, I am 26 years old and have no intention of having kids anytime soon with my wife, so I cannot speak at all to Dusty's level of education. Uh, I can't speak, though, to her integrity and her dedication to everything she's ever done. I met her back in 2011, and uh, ever since then, she's been really a, a mentor to me, a mentor to basically everyone she's come into contact with, and one of the best four people. And uh, like I said, I can't speak to her level of education or how she'll do teaching, but 
I can definitely speak to her high character. Okay, all right. Well, thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Do you have one more? I, um, and then uh, the, the applicant, uh, uh, did you want uh, her to respond now or once you start your discussion, do we want to? Uh, if the applicant would like to make a short response, we can do that now before okay. we go to uh, commission's discussion. Thank you for the opportunity to rebuttal um, some of the things that were said. I um, do not want to take this time to slander anybody. I do not want to take this time to um, to just be sour against anybody, but I would like the opportunity to speak on the behalf of the 911 call of a suicide attempt. Which was illegal to report. Which is illegal to speak of. Um, it violates privacy, but since it's out there, you should know that my son did struggle, does struggle with depression. And it's, we believe, adolescent. And when last year he was diagnosed, his psychiatrist put, or his, actually his physician, you know, he have a psychiatrist then, put him on a medication that he had adverse effects to. He had a severe reaction to it, which caused suicidal thoughts. Basically, the, the black box warning, he had them all. So yes, there were many calls to the police department, and we had ambulances and police cars at our house often last summer which is also why I didn't leave my house because I was on constant suicide watch for my son. Hence, why my yard had overgrown weeds. I will take full responsibility for that. That absolutely did happen. However, my son's life meant more to me that summer than before, than anything else. Prior to that year, my yard was not overgrown. I took very good care of my yard and my yard looks good this year too. My priority last year was my son's well-being. He is happily reported. He is on the right medication and I have not had to call the police or ambulance in well over six months. According to licensing, the Lara uh, licensing, I am required to have a letter approving that he can be around children to approve that he is safe. I go Monday, I have no reservation, no worries that he will not be, he will not receive that letter. He is doing fabulous. He works a full-time job at Garden City Cafe. He's a working member of our community. He goes to school. He's passed all of his grades, as well as all of my other children. They are very hard workers, even despite a very ugly illness. So um, I would encourage, I don't know how 39 people could sign a petition against me because I've never talked to any of my neighbors except for the person who's directly next to me. And I've um, talked to Lori maybe twice, but none of these 39 neighbors, while they've seen um, police and ambulances, I would be happy to share with them what was going on, but nobody showed a concern. So this is my petition to say, if anybody has a concern about how I raise my children or other pe or teach other people's children, my, I gave them all letters on my block today with my phone number, and I would be happy to help walk through any concerns or address any of that. So I also last taught in March. I also, oh, and also I last taught in March when COVID made me go on a uh, layoff. Okay, Fred, this is Matt Miller, the city clerk. I, we're really into deep weeds regarding privacy issues on behalf of the city. So uh, okay. I think our comment should be ended. Yeah, I, okay. I think uh, we don't need to go into that anymore. Okay, thank you, Fred. Uh, okay. And if possibly we could uh, disable the chat feature as well. It does seem to get extensive use for sidebar discussions rather than an opportunity for those without technical ability to put their comment in during the public comment section. Yeah. Thank you, Mario. 
Uh, Dusty, were you done with your comments? Um, yes, I'm done. Okay. Thank you. I, I appreciate your comments. Thank you. Thank and you, Dusty. Now again, we'll close the public hearing and uh, move on to uh, planning commission discussion for the uh, special land use. Uh, anyone wish to make a comment or have a question about the uh, proposal for special land use? Okay, if, uh, if not, I think we could uh, consider a motion, but I think probably if we do uh, vote to approve, that it should be conditional on uh, the, uh, the items listed under Mr. Ortega's uh, recommendations, including approval of the total tag plan and a uh, fire inspection, whether or not that's required by the state. Uh, does someone want to make a motion? I'll go ahead and make a motion to um, recommend that we grant the site um, plan approval condition upon the following one through four on uh, Mario's recommendations of the site okay. plan. We're, this motion would be to recommend approval by the city council. Oh, Diane, uh, we're doing the, the special land use right oh, now. I'm sorry. He's that's breaking right. up, so I'm having a hard time hearing. Okay. Well, that, uh, that's, that's why I'm here. I'm here to translate. Thank you. So, Diane, do you have a, a motion then to uh, recommend approval with the following conditions A through D? Is that your motion? Yes, I'll make that motion. I'll second that. Motion made second any discussion. Uh, just point of order. Uh, the the reference to my um, any kind of operation plan was just based on some recommendations for what you feel is the appropriate quantity for number of cars operate uh, visiting the site in 15 minute period and and uh, those type of uh, specifics. So you might want to have a discussion about what you feel is appropriate in terms of frequency of visits to the site. Would you be comfortable making that an administrative decision? Um, just given the fact that this is going to be seen by council next, because technically you make a recommendation and then council have the opportunity to pick it up or not. Um, if I could at least hear some of your opinions, I think that might be best uh, in terms of whether it's uh, one, two, three cars in a one or two cars per uh, 15 minute period or something to that effect. Yeah, I, I, actually, I think that sounds reasonable. Two cars every 15 minutes doesn't take too long to pick up a couple of kids. So, uh, what does everybody feel about that? Well, Dusty previously mentioned that she will have the parents text her uh, when they're on their way in their expected arrival, I believe it was. So the fact that she's staggering it, I think is sufficient at this point because 15 minutes in order to have 12 children dropped off at two per, that would spread the time out over quite a considerable length of time. I, with the very young children, chances are, and the parents won't be going in the house. The biggest thing I'd like to see is that the driveway be kept clear enough to where two cars are able to pull in at a time. 
and that people are not, let's make it where two cars are able to pull in at a time and people are not allowed to make pickups or drop-offs on the street. And then well, that will be self-limiting. We don't want people stacking on the street either, you know, waiting to get in the driveway. I think I think by by spreading it out, you know, ten or fifteen minutes between a couple of cars picking up would eliminate the problem of having cars stacked up on the road waiting to uh, to get in the driveway to make a pickup. Okay, that sounds reasonable. I mean, if you if you think you know, if you think it takes too long to do it at 15 minutes, maybe we can say, you know, spreading them out uh, two cars every 10 minutes, and that at least will will spread out the group enough so we don't have a large amount of cars piling up in the road. How how about this? If we do two for every 15 minutes, that spreads it out over an hour and a half. That may not work for everybody involved, parents, et cetera. She said the parents won't be coming in the house. How about if we limit it to two cars on the street, two cars in the driveway, and let her do the scheduling? Because the parents are going to be calling her. They're going to be young children. They're not coming in the house. So if they're walking from the driveway or the street up to the front porch and dropping off their children, she's already expecting them because they text her and said, I'm on my way. Why don't we limit it to no more than two cars on the street and two cars in the driveway and let her schedule it however long it takes people to drop off their children. In other words, she won't tell she won't respond to sick people at the same time and say, sure, come drop your kids off because there's not enough holding space for six cars. Well, if she doesn't, if she doesn't schedule them ahead of time, they're just going to show up when they're ready. You know, they. Well, if we tell her, say, hey, I'm here. <laughs> if we put the onus on her and say, we don't want more than two cars in the street or two cars in the driveway at any given time. Yeah. And no neighbors will be inconvenienced oh. with a lineup of cars. And we put the onus on her to schedule it accordingly. How do you feel about that, Mar Mario? I think we put in the stipulation that um, the operation plan shall function with the intent to not uh, occur stacking on site on the street that might get the point across that would uh, be the criteria and it would give the um, ordinance enforcement a specific trigger as to when they're to cause um, you know a violation to be considered so if there's stacking on this on the street into the driveway then that's what's causing a, a violation of a special use standard so that could work Okay. Okay. Let's. Do you have that, Brian? Yes, I do. Okay, good. Uh, it should. One of the conditions should also be removal of the pool, spa, and trampoline. And the hot tub. <laughs> And what? And hot tub. Oh, uh, hot tub. It's got water in it. It's a potential danger. Yeah. Well, she said they were both going. She said that they were being sold and they were going to move prior to opening. Right. Um, let's make sure that that happens or that they're properly fenced. Well, we're we're saying they need to be removed. Okay, better yet. Yeah. Okay, with those conditions, uh, we have a uh, motion and uh, support. We do. 
Brian, would you take a roll? Yep. Commissioner Kalitas? Aye. Commissioner Steenberg? Aye. Commissioner Mativier? Aye. Chairperson May? Aye. Okay, uh, moving on next is site plan review. Uh, Mr. Ortega, would you uh, like to go through your report? Um, yes, basically, uh, I did touched on some of that, but uh, maybe you could run over it. Yeah, correct. That's exactly what I was about to say, Fred, that I have touched on that because um, as we've just discussed, the main function of the, excuse me, the main focus of the approval is about how the site will function and whether um, it'll function in such a way as to not uh, negatively impact any residents. So you've done that with an operation plan for special use. And so um, I would just say that in addition to, to compliance with the operations plan that you just considered, uh, specifically state that the, uh, um, the re the cars of the the, res the vehicles of the residents be placed uh, either in the park in the garage or uh, to the rear of the house. So that way, to get those two parking spaces that, that uh, Commissioner uh, Steenberg was referring to, and then also specifically any uh, lighting installation um, to make sure that uh, they are not they're shielded directly downward and not in any way impact. Uh, any glare onto the adjacent property. Okay. Uh, that, can, that, that, that could be effectively done, I believe, meeting uh, any LARA requirements, meeting any building code requirements, and also uh, still function adequately. So I think just as long as any lighting that is chosen to or is actually required to shield the director downward and does not uh, shine, on t does not have a uh, fixtures visible from the adjacent property. Okay. I have one uh, question uh, on setback requirements. I know the plan meets the uh, normal R1 setback requirements, but in 154.142 section D about child care, it says that they're required to have a 25 foot minimum side setback. Is that not correct? That is correct. Uh, however, I do believe, let me get to it, but I do believe that's with regards to child care centers and where this is a group daycare home. So the child, if you recall, the child care centers are the more of the commercial, um, commercial facilities are located, for example, like the I can't remember the one. There's the one on Inkster Road, uh, north of Ford. That's typically a child care center. Uh, you're uh, saying that section doesn't apply to residential uh, group? Because the only other residential group care is talking about adult group care. Correct. Yeah. So so if you, uh, the, the first sentence in uh, 154.142 is following regulations apply to group daycare homes. Uh, child care centers, nursery schools, day nurseries, and preschools. So then, this is paragraph to the child care center. Uh, no, it's it's um, it's one of those criteria where um, all group take care homes and child care centers are child care facilities, but not all child care facilities, child care centers are equal to the. So the umbrella term is child care facility. I guess I should say the umbrella term uh -huh. is child care facility. So that includes the family, the group, and the centers. And so then um, a child care center is specifically the commercial aspect of where it's greater than 12. Because if we go to our definitions, um, there's a separate definition for child care center versus um, a group daycare home. Because uh, I can read it for you. Uh, the child care center is a facility other than a private residence, receiving one or more preschool or school aged children for care periods of less than 24 hours. So, okay, well, I covered it then. Yeah. So, that was my only other problem. Does anyone else have a 
question or comment about the uh, site plan recommendations? Not here, thank you. I'm good. I'm good. Okay. Well, again, if, if we vote to approve the uh, site plan recommendation, I think it should be with the conditions as listed, including the lighting and uh, were there any uh, specific land, landscaping uh, issues that, I mean, I haven't been able to see the backyard, so I don't really know what the backyard looks like, but I'm assuming that when the state comes out to inspect it, they're going to look for a uh, 5,000 square foot play area that's suitable for the kids to play in. But other than that, um, I think what Laura does is probably probably sufficient in that area. I tend to agree as long as the uh, property is fenced and the applicant assured us that it was completely fenced. And one of the, uh, um, excuse me, one of the requirements of the special use approval in my letter was to for the applicant to prevent a resized plan that shows specifically the boundaries of the 5,000 square foot area. Yeah. Does someone want to make a motion for conditional approval? I'll make a motion for conditional approval. With the four conditions as listed in Mr. Yes, that's correct. Review. Yes, that's correct. There's support. Support. Any discussion? Take the roll, please. Mr. Steenberg? Aye. Commissioner Kalitas? Aye. Commissioner Mativier? Aye. Chairperson May? Aye. Well, Dusty, if you're uh, still with us, your uh, site plan has been approved at, with those conditions and uh, your, uh, your special land use has to go before the council for their approval with our recommendation. So good luck with that. And uh, of course, you have to get your state license too. Okay, moving on. Other, other business. Uh, zoning ordinance amendment. Discussion of revised amendment language regarding medical marijuana caregiver grow operations and other potential ordinance amendments. Uh, you want to take a look at the uh, marijuana grow operations first. That's the one that seems to have more most detail. Uh, Mr. Ortega, could you uh, tell me what the impetus for uh, presenting us with the marijuana revision? Yes. Um, so, with regards to uh, prim uh, primary caregivers uh, growing marijuana for their medical, their certified or their registered patients. Um, in the past, uh, I'll try and make a very long story very, somewhat shorter. So basically the initial law that allowed for medical marijuana did not have any location requirements for where and how these facilities could be located. Um, over the course of various uh, um, lawsuits and court cases, uh, the, the up until April, the, the appellate court ruled that um, caregivers could basically conduct any legal activity anywhere and that local city, local municipalities were not allowed to regulate them as long as they abided by all the statutory requirements. However, uh, in April, the Supreme Court uh, ruled on the case and said that 
Uh, no cities are allowed to exercise their Zoning Enabling Act uh, powers and regulate where caregivers would be allowed to grow um, these, uh, grow their, their medicine for their patients. Um, so that, so that first of all, the infant, first half of the emphasis is because uh, we now have the authority to regulate them. Uh, the second half being over the course of uh, the year as we've allowed uh, caregivers to operate uh, anywhere in the city, um, there have been various uh, building code, uh, excuse me, building uh, department issues with regards to, for example, I believe there was at least one if not two transformers that started to melt <laughs> in the neighborhoods, in the residential neighborhoods due to the electrical load uh, drawn by these caregivers because under the Medical Marijuana Act, they're allowed to grow up to 72 plants per caregiver in a home. So in theory, if there were two caregivers in one home, they could grow 144 plants. And there are, at, up until at, at this point in time, our ordinance specifically says that actually that caregivers are, do not require special use and they can be allowed to operate as long as they just abide by um, state statute. Now, these caregivers are still bound, even today, by the building code requirements. Uh, and so, but that's beholden up to them to come in to the building department and apply for the proper electrical permit or mechanical permit to um, have the appropriate facilities. Whether these do or do not come in, unfortunately, that's complaint driven. And until these incidents occurred, we weren't sure how they, uh, their violation of uh, codes was impacting us. Um, so right now in front of you is just draft, uh, a draft idea of a potential way to regulate them. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be this way as proposed uh, because in, once again, in the, the theory behind it and the reason why the city has allowed them in the, in the city is because uh, the idea that they're providing medicine to certain individuals. Um, now, obviously one thing impacting all this is the fact that since that time, the MMRTA, the Medical Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Authority Act, um, allows all individuals over 18, I believe it's 18, could be 21, uh, to grow up to 12 plants for their own personal use for any adult. Um, so we will not be regulating that. This would just be in the event that a caregiver has uh, wants to grow more than 12 plants on a property. Um, so as proposed, uh, basically just taking the idea that because of the quantity and size and scale of these operations, it'd probably be best to start out allowing them only in the industrial, because that's where we allow our commercial facilities for marijuana. And basically the, the, the draft language in front of you says, number one, they have to be located in the M1 district. Uh, number two, they have to meet all the separation requirements as is the commercial facilities, which is 300 feet from any, um, get, I think it's 300, 300 feet from any residentially zoned property, and then uh, 500 feet from any child care center or child care facility, I should say, and 500 feet from any public park. Um, but in addition to that, in order to They've also included ideas of uh, having uh, these uh, primary caregivers not be located on a, on a property directly adjacent to another medical marijuana facility. Or, um, and then the idea that specifically only one licensed medical marijuana a primary caregiver shall be permitted uh, on a single lot at any time. And the main reason for that is so that way people, so that way our industrial district as it suddenly become compliant completely every lot being utilized by uh, medical marijuana because as a planning commission you want to make sure that you protect the uh, economic viability of the industrial park and you wouldn't and allowing one industry to be utilizing all the land in the industrial park could negatively impact it because if that industry falls out of favor if something happens to that industry then suddenly the entire industrial park could become vacant if all these, if the entire thing was utilized by medical marijuana. So that buffering 
at least just making sure they're not directly adjacent. And that was the intent of that. So it's just one idea. Uh, I'm open to hear your thoughts about whether it should be regulated any different than we regulate it now, or if this is a good idea. Well, I, can, or something else. I can definitely see that it, it presents a problem when you start growing more than 12 plants in a home, because if no other thing, the electrical uh, requirements of uh, providing for them. And I have heard that it also creates an odor problem nearby. So I'm, I'm not totally opposed to having caregivers with over 12 plants moving to the industrial park, but I'm a little bit opposed to restricting the land use there the same way that we have for the uh, commercial growers, because that's going to really limit the amount of space available to those uh, caregivers. And it just doesn't seem like it's, it, it's going to put most of them out of the city or out of business, one or the other. Uh, many of them don't have large numbers of plants like that. They they grow the plants necessary in the patient's home and cultivate it there. Some I understand do have larger growths and could use that, but I wouldn't I wouldn't be in favor of having all the restrictive language that's applied to the other growers apply to them too. And on top of that, our our city council has already limited the number of growers to three properties in uh, the industrial park. Now, if, if we only if we open it up to more than three properties, doesn't that affect the commercial growers as well as the caregivers? Because you can call them commercial growers too. So I I don't know about that. I think I think basically personally, I would rather see our direction come from city council to see what they want to do because they're going to make up their mind in the end anyway. So I would like to see them address it first. And after they find something out or come up with a solution, whether it's this or something else, I would like to see it go before the city attorney to make sure we're not violating state law in some way by being more strict or not, uh, not complying with the state or being overly restrictive. So I, I would like to see it go to the city council and then the city attorney and then come to us when they have something that we can work with. And what does everybody else do? But then, yeah, yeah. Fred, could I interject a little? Yeah, okay, man. This is, hi. Uh, just the, the only thing is, is that the council, um, they really can make a language for you to review. It's up to the commission to make the recommendation to them. Okay. You know, um, in the mo in the motion in the motion that was made, you know, in the moratorium, it was actually directing the planning commission to uh, develop the language. Um, of course, you know, you can always develop the language. Commission never got involved with the moratorium. That was all done by council. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Sorry. The moratorium. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You left. I think you left that out. Yeah. Um, that and also the the motion. What was in the motion was directing the planning commission to develop the language. The, of course, the council gives the planning commission the authority, but also supports that authority with the hiring of a professional of McKinnon Associates to provide guidance to give you that for for review. So that's, I just wanted to uh, clarify. And I know that Mario didn't mention that, so I wanted to make sure that was part of the discussion. Yeah, that's okay. correct. I'm sorry, I didn't uh, include that. But uh, you did have the memo that I sent to council with regards to, they did in fact do a moratorium on any uh, additional licenses for uh, excuse me, certificates of occupancy for caregivers currently for six months. 
Um, and then they did direct uh, planning commission to make something. So Fred also, um, the planning commission, as Matt said, uh, you know, was entrusted with this and then but there's nothing to say that what you sent to the council won't necessarily get kicked back to you. So it might come back to you with their recommendations or they might feel that you've uh, successfully done it in, in, in exactly the way they like. Because uh, so far we've been a, we've had a pretty good job lately of getting things through council. So I'd like to think we do a good job. <laughs> um, but I hear what you're saying. So uh, rest assured that the council will have the opportunity to um, provide you comments. And then also, of course, every ordinance that we um, review, uh, propose does get reviewed by uh, the attorney. Okay, well, my, uh, you know, going down the, the ordinance, first of all, and location being in the M1 district, I'm not opposed to that. I don't think it should be required to meet all of the same uh, separation distances as the other growers do. Uh, I'm not sure that two caregivers can't occupy one building at the same time either. Uh, I don't I don't see the harm in that. Especially given the size of the lots in the industrial park. Too much, I think, pardon me? Especially given the size of the lots in the industrial park, they're pretty pretty large, and so I think that that's a good point. Well, it's all going to be on the interior of the buildings anyway. It's not going to be on the outside. So right. lot size really doesn't mean as much as building size. I don't see any reason why we can't go with two adjacent properties because some of the buildings that would be appropriate for that type of thing may be right next to each other, whereas the one half a block away might not be as good. I mean, as far as having one, one business taking over most of the industrial park, I think we've already got that with aluminum extrusion. They've uh, eaten up most of the, the park as it is. But uh, I, you know, if, we, if we whittle this down a little bit, I, I would be uh, more in favor of it. So how does everybody else feel? Whatever we do, I think we have to consider how enforceable is, however we change this ordinance, how enforceable is it gonna be down the road? In terms of legally or? No, I mean, in terms of practicality. Until we have a problem at a residence and we go in and find that they have 100 plants in the basement and say, well, you can't have them here. But until then, nobody will know it unless there's a complaint. Correct. So, you know, we. Well, well actually. The ability to shut it down after we find it. I think I. I have a question. Do we, does the city know how many medical marijuana primary caregivers there are in Garden City? No, we do not. Because they are only allowed, they only have to abide by um, the state law right now. Okay. And so they, they might be, have their license address in the city, but there's not to, to know if their grow operations exist in the city. Plus, as Fred said, people might be a caregiver, they might be have their residence in the city, but they might go to individual homes to take care of the individual plants of the patients. <coughs> um, but one thing, uh, Mike, if I uh, uh, could address with regards to enforcement, one other uh, idea that we would be utilizing in terms of uh, making, in terms of ensuring compliance with this would be, um, there's, there's a, uh, strategy and a policy that have been effectively done in other communities. Map again. I know we we looked at 
that back when we were doing the, uh, the other growers, but uh, I'd like to see how that would affect this. So maybe the next time around. Maybe we, we could, could have. Uh, map for us. Yeah. Yes, I yeah, maybe we could have Mario uh, reacquaint us with the three and 500 foot map and then go from there. Yeah, that would be a place to start. I think so. So we can see if there's even any room for expansion. Yeah. Okay. And again, this would only affect uh, people with more than 12 plants. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. All right, let's move on and uh, look at the other uh, proposed uh, amendments that we have. The first one, residential design standards to require a higher quality of design than the standard modular home. Uh, what is a standard modular home? Um, basically, this is, came up because there are some recent homes that were constructed in the city in which they met our current standards, but our current standards are mainly to ensure that um, a mobile home slash modular home doesn't get sited on a property. So that usually involves, you know, having a foundation and not being uh, on wheels and that sort of thing. And so if the homes I that think, have, Well, I think we're talking about two different types of manufactured homes. Correct. Yeah. And there's also two different uh, building standards that they use, and I'm not sure which is which, but a, uh, a factory built modular home can be very attractive depending on the, the design it's built to. That's correct. Uh, I think along with design standards, and I have a couple of uh, factory built homes at the end of my street, and they wouldn't be bad looking homes, except they have no landscaping. Maybe we need to look at including a requirement for a minimum amount of landscaping with any new home. Yeah, actually that's something that's done in other communities. Like for example, at least one uh, tree in the front yard, one in the rear, uh, you know, foundation landscaping. Uh, where in the um, Oh, that's a good point. I, I think if we're going to look at that, that be, would be something that could be added to it. Yeah, and you're absolutely right, Fred. Uh, modular homes, when they're factory built, whether it's their individual components or even in like majority of the home, when it's built onto a site, uh, it could be uh, attractive based on the design. And so the idea would be to get a little bit more specific with regards to design, for example, uh, not maybe not requiring just a stoop, but requiring some type of covered front porch, um, okay. requiring okay. some type of articulation. Oh, that can be, yeah, that can be done. I know. And I, I, you know, I don't think we want to talk about trailers that are being set on a lot because I know that's happening in Garden Day, and that doesn't really look that great. But factory built homes can be very attractive. Yeah. You know, with, with the proper design <coughs> standards, I, I think that's a good idea. Yeah, any absolutely, and I agree. Other, yes. Any other comments? Um, if we're going to explore this in any greater detail, which I think we need to do, due to the hour, could we move this to our next meeting? Getting uh, a little late? Yeah. Right, Shame on me. Right on. I didn't eat dinner beforehand, and uh, lunch didn't happen, and breakfast was an it seemed like two days ago. So, so in other words, you're hungry. I'm ready to start eating the uh, agenda here. Let me bring Mike a snack. <laughs> it doesn't look that appetizing. I... Okay. Uh, but I think we could probably explore this in greater detail. 
which I think well, we I need think to. It does serve a little greater detail, but before we leave, I had questions about just the general idea you were going for with several of these. Could you tell us what you had in mind with shared parking? Yes. So um, real quickly, uh, with regards to shared parking, uh, we've run across this with uh, some of the sites that have multi-tenants. The idea that uh, on a multi-tenant site, they have to provide the full parking, minimum parking requirement for any individual, every individual use. Um, and that's something that uh, a lot of other municipalities tweak by saying every use based on hours of operation. So for example, uh, if there are um, a site which has an, like two offices and one restaurant requirement um, and, and the hours of operation of the restaurant are more for a dinner service and the offices. Hey, could we not talk about food? <laughs> uh, the nightclub ahead, the nightclub is uh open late and all they're serving is alcohol and <laughs> and the Thank office you. and the office users um shut down at five o'clock the idea that not the whole thing not the whole thing is taken off because we don't want to get into that issue but it's by percentage so i would it would just be uh addition of a table that said if the planning commission felt it was appropriate it could utilize this as an option yeah. or uh, modulating it based on hours of operation and a mix of, and the mix of uses on a site. Yeah, we're always, we're, we always have parking problems. We never have enough room. Right. That's true. Uh, and, and possibly well, accessory, accessory structures, are you wanting to add accessory structures or prohibit them? No, it would be about uh, regulating more specifically some standards, like for example, pole barns, because we've increased the size of uh, allowable accessory structures on a site on our larger lots. Um, yeah. Some people want to do construction of a pole barn, and then it would just be specifically saying things like uh, including the requirement for a rat wall, um, because that kind of, it's, which is a deep foundation uh, specifically. And so those kind of things would ensure that the pole barns aren't just getting thrown up with just sheet metal along the uh, yeah. along the side. That's okay. what All right, I, I I'm not a big fan of pole barns anyway in in town. I mean they look too commercial for a residential district in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, and I got an idea of, about the number of vehicles and on residential lots and the hard surface in front, we wanna just restrict all that hard surface? Yeah, to the greatest extent that we can because uh, there are definitely some sites where, and part of it is an enforcement issue because they come in and they say they're only gonna put in like a circular drive and then they ended up paving both the, the front and rear of the circular drive and then the hot cars are parking perpendicular yeah. to the front facade of the homes. Yeah, so there's a there's a house across Middle Belt that regularly has 16 cars parked in their yard. Right, that yeah. kind of thing. Not the only one. No. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> There's one on Box Street. The entire front yard, although it's a small house from the 30s, the entire front yard is blacktop. Not a blade of grass in sight. Right. Okay. Well. Why don't we uh, why don't we table a discussion on the rest of these and uh, pick it up at our next meeting? Okay, I'll second that. The next regular planning commission meeting would be Thursday, September 10th, and uh, yes, we'll uh, accept the motion to adjourn. Uh, what is the likelihood that we'll zoom that meeting or? Will that be in a live in person? I don't know. Okay. TBD then. Yeah. Go away, Mike. Motion is to adjourn. Second? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say um, the Zoom versus in person, a lot of it is depending on the executive orders and the extensions. Um, it initially was extended uh, till the end of July, and then 
they added another one. So now we're still legally within our right to do it electronically. Um, and also along the line with public gatherings right now still being limited, you know, no more than 10. Um, we're st we still fall, you know, tonight we would have had more than would be, you know, allowed under the state executive order. So, but it's, yeah, it's up in the air. Um, we'll, you know, when the next meeting, before the next meeting, we'll see where we're at legally and what we can do. And then we'll figure it out then. Super. Okay, great. Uh, hearing that, uh, meeting's adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Good night, everyone. All righty. Good night. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.